Is government out of reach for everyday people? Today you will learn about the incredible organizations God has mobilized to fight for biblical values in states and across America. Welcome to Freedom Alive. Many people today feel they don't have a voice in government and that their values aren't represented in government policy and lawmaking. With life so hectic, it's difficult to keep up with all that's going on, and so many people don't know how to get involved. Well, I'm here to tell you, God is mobilizing people across America, and today's guest will tell us about an organization working behind the scenes on your behalf and how you, too, can get involved. Our guest today is Peggy Neenaber, Vice President of Faith and Liberty, who will share how you can get involved. Matt, today we're talking about how God is mobilizing people and organizations to fight for biblical values in America. And it's not necessarily how some people think. There's obviously the legal, which goes in the courts. There's the public policy with regards to legislation and local laws. But there's also other ministry that is spiritual in nature, and that really works at the heart level. And that is so critical to do with our elected leaders, especially under the pressure that they are under in the nation's capital. And that's what Faith and Liberty is all about. It is a missionary ministry to the nation's capital. You think about missionaries going around the world but we oftentimes don't think of missionaries going to our nation's capital. And yet this is the most powerful nation on earth. And this is the place in our nation where the United States Supreme Court is located, the highest court in the country. That court is looked to around the world by other courts and justices and lawyers and lawmakers around the country. Then there's the Congress that enacts the laws. And then there's the executive, the president of the United States. All of those are so critical And for many, many years, they've been neglected. But the Ministry of Faith and Liberty has been in the nation's capital for many years. And it literally is a transformative missionary ministry to our nation's capital. Matt, thank you. We can't wait to bring this interview to you. But first, our Freedom Update is next. In March of 2020, there were no restrictions on churches. And then as we moved toward the middle of March 2020, around the country, various restrictions began to occur. Eventually, you had in March and early April, restrictions in some places where you couldn't even worship at all. The first pastor in the world was arrested in Florida, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, pastor of the River Church at Tampa Bay. And this particular church was open on the last Sunday of March. There was no statewide lockdown, but Hillsborough County began to restrict churches. And pastor ultimately had the church service as planned. But on Monday, the last Monday of March, was arrested. And that was a shot, if you will, that was heard around the world. That became global news across the world. The first pastor on the planet to be arrested under these restrictions from COVID. Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, ultimately two days later on April 1, issued an executive order declaring that churches were essential and attendance there was essential activity, freeing up churches in Florida completely. But the other states didn't follow that example. In fact, California was the worst state in the country. California in March began to say no worship at all. There was a short period of time where the governor allowed 25% capacity, but only for 100 days, and then came back and said no worship at all. Nearly 300 days in California, it was illegal criminal activity punishable by to a year in prison, to have even one person walk into a church for a pastor to be able to have any contact with people in a church, no matter the size of the sanctuary. Now, some people say, well, maybe they could just simply worship in their homes. No, California had a ban on home Bible studies and worship and fellowship with anybody who doesn't live in that particular home, apartment, or condo. It was criminal as well. Unbelievable that this would happen in the United States of America. Liberty Council represented Harvest Rock Church, founded by Pastor Cheon, who has an international ministry, and also the founder of Harvest International Ministry. That ministry has about 130 or so churches in California, 65,000 churches and affiliate ministries 
worldwide. It's a worldwide ministry located in 70 nations. This particular pastor ultimately became a very central target of this issue. He got a criminal citation letter from the Pasadena prosecutor that said, if you continue to have worship in your church, you will be criminally charged up to a year in prison, all your staff members and anybody who attends your church. That means anybody who walks into the church would face criminal charges up to a year in prison and daily fines of $1,000. I've never seen anything like it. Never in my imagination did I believe that we would come to a place that quickly, that in America it was illegal, criminal, to have worship in a church, to even have worship in your home or at somebody else's home, even to go there and pray or anoint them with oil if they were sick or in need. Criminal in California. Other states had other kinds of restrictions, and many states still do. But we filed suit in California. We lost at the lower court, lost at the Court of Appeals, went to the United States Supreme Court, and won on December 3, 2020. The court sent the case back down, told them to reevaluate it in light of its clear roadmap that these restrictions are unconstitutional. But you know what? The courts didn't listen. We lost again at the district court, lost again at the Court of Appeals, two to one, went back to the U.S. Supreme Court on this emergency request for a, an injunction, an order pending appeal to stop these unconstitutional restrictions. On February 5, 2021, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in our favor, gave us an injunction pending the appeal, meaning that the most egregious restriction was barred by the Supreme Court the no worship restriction. California, however, still continued to have other restrictions that were unconstitutional, including no singing and chanting. You know, the Bible talks about singing praises to the Lord, coming together, laying hands on other individuals, singing praises to one another. That can't be accomplished merely by a podcast. And yet the governor had the audacity to say, it's not prohibited. It's prohibited. In fact, it is violating his order and criminal charges. We continue to litigate, and the great news is this, breaking news, that California now has settled the case with our clients, Harvest Rock Church, Harvest International Ministry. We now have a statewide, permanent, not temporary, permanent injunction prohibiting the governor, Gavin Newsom, and the state of California from ever again placing discriminatory restrictions on churches and places of worship. What is very clear is that Caesar does not control the church. Jesus said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Pay your taxes even though you don't agree with them. But render to God what belongs to God. The church has always belonged to Jesus Christ. This is an incredible development. The most restrictive state in the nation becomes the first place in the nation to have a permanent injunction statewide, removing all restrictions not only now, but into the permanent future as well. We will never go down this road again. And this will now be a domino that ultimately falls on another domino and topple all these restrictions across the country. It's a great victory. We're not done yet, but we're not going to have religious freedom and the right to worship just simply dissipate on our watch. Matt, thank you for that incredible update. Uh, I marvel at how God has worked in this whole issue. It's been um, disconcerting. Uh, unbelievable to watch to your point about how this has happened in our country. The Supreme Court has now spoken many times on this, uh, yet there are still states too uh, free, right? Can you speak to That's that? That's right. The Supreme Court has had 12 different cases and they've given five injunctions pending appeal, but those are on an emergency basis. So they're not final orders. And so some states are still restricting churches and places of worship. So California is free, which is an amazing praise to God that California is free. All the churches are free. But there's still other states where churches are laboring under restrictions, and we're working in those states, mm -hmm. representing pastors and churches, to make sure the gates of hell are literally kicked down and that these restrictions are never reimposed upon the church of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, on behalf of so many, I just want to thank you for your leadership, your continued leadership on this issue. It is a big, big deal. Uh, right now, we're going to move forward with Matt's interview with Peggy Neenaber of Faith and Liberty. Peggy, I'm so excited about this interview because most people, when they think of Washington, D.C., they think of partisan politics. They think of wrangling. But there's an entirely different ministry 
that is taking place on Capitol Hill. It's been there for many years, and you're vice president of Faith and Liberty, a ministry now that is part of Liberty Council. But Faith and Liberty is neither a legal ministry like Liberty Council, right. nor is it a public policy ministry like Liberty Council Action. It is a spiritual transformative ministry. Tell us a little bit about what Faith and Liberty's mission is. We are your missionaries on Capitol Hill. Uh, Cap Washington, D.C., right here in Capitol Hill, is a totally different city like most. There's power. There's all kinds of things happening every day, whether it's law, whether it's legislation, whether it's people coming from their homes that who've never been in Washington, D.C. And everybody thinks it's this great city until they get here. And there's a lot of clicks and there's a lot of um, things that go not quite what you expect. And so what we do as a ministry here on Capitol Hill, Hill, we're here, we're that support system. We're that spiritual support system through prayer. And so those that have come to Capitol Hill that find themselves in these different types of clicks or uh, directions or offices that uh, it's not working with uh, lining up with how they feel, they need prayer. And we're the ministry right here on Capitol Hill, uh, changing the heart and minds of not only our elected officials, but the staffers all the way down to those that even work uh, in the hallways or the kitchens or anywhere else. So Faith and Liberty is really a missionary ministry to the nation's capital. And it has a mission to all three branches of government, the mm -hmm. uh, executive, legislative, the judicial. judicial, as well as all of the agencies that are there. It's been an amazing ministry. Tell us about a particular story that I found amazing as God worked incredible miracles just down the street. Faith and Liberty was the first ministry where you are right now, right across from the Supreme Court. And point your finger to where the U.S. Supreme Court is. That's right it. Behind that me. is the U.S. Supreme Court. That's the east facade of the Supreme Court. And show the viewers where the justices actually meet together to you do conferences those, and decisions on their cases. Those top two windows, right? The windows that are right here, or where they meet on Fridays to make those final uh, decisions of opinions that come out. And the amazing thing is when they're there and they look out, they can see the front of the Faith and Ministry building. And in the front of the Faith and Ministry building is the Ten Commandments. Yes, it is. An 850-pound granite, Ten Commandments, and it is turned prominently so that when you're sitting in that conference room, you cannot miss the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of things that Faith and Liberty does and that you do that obviously we can't put in a newsletter, can't put in an email, can't do a press release because it's private relationships that are spiritually transformative. Some of them are very sensitive because people share what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it is a ministry, like you say, it is a missionary ministry to the nation's capital. And if people could even understand the impact, it would be incredible. But some of the impact is also the Bible studies. There's more Bible studies and fellowship taking place in this ministry center where you are right now across from the U.S. Supreme Court than in most churches in the country. Tell us about what's happening there with the Bible studies and the fellowship of all these different people from the nation's capital. Uh, we, we closed our doors like everybody else because we thought that's what we were supposed to be doing with all the restrictions. But after about a month or two months, I thought this isn't what we're here for. This is what our ministry is going to do. With our front doors closed, it's just not going to help. So we opened it up for very small groups, but those groups ended up bigger. You could tell that there were staff craving for uh, mm. the gospel. There were staff craving. We had a Bible study yesterday. A staff person said, I need to just have prayer with someone. I just need to get these thoughts out of my head. I've become depressed. What these Bible studies do is they reach out to staffers that are away from their states away from their uh, family. And these staffers come, there's prayers, there's private stories, there's time for their families, for those that actually live in the area. And this Bible studies just started with a small one and they're just expanding every week that we do these. And they're in different directions. You know, one Bible study uh, is theological. Uh, we've got apologetics. We've got all different types for all different needs. And then we have family night. You just want to hang with like-minded like folks and, and fellowship with those. But we've been able to help these staffers know that there's a place right here on Capitol Hill that they can actually come. And you have, you have them for men, you have them for women, you have them for mixed groups, you have them for different ages. And it literally, the ministry center is open all the time. 
uh, and time. through the weekend with all of these incredible Bible studies, fellowship mm -hmm. that's taking place right there in the nation's capital. And these are people that are working, many of them, in the halls of Congress. They are policymakers. Yes. They're working in various other parts of the ministry of, of, of the government mm -hmm. of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., the most powerful nation on the planet. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is, is incredible, and, and I hope that this actually is encouraging to people, and we'll have some footage of this as well, is the Capitol Hill Bible Reading Marathon. It happens every year in May during the, or leading up to the National Day of Prayer. Tell us what happens with the Capitol Hill Bible Reading Marathon. So the U.S. Capitol Bible Reading Marathon was started 32 years ago. Is actually somebody kind of telling somebody, I bet you can't do this, and they mm -hmm. did it. We start on a Saturday. Every 15 minutes, we sign up readers to read the Bible standing right on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, right in our nation's capital. And it's so that the Word of God, everybody's saying, what are you doing that for? It's so that we can pronounce the Word of God right in our main city and everybody can hear it. And we sign people up and we read around the clock. Yes, we read at 2 and 3 and 4 a.m. We have people signed up constantly. The last two years, we even had people virtually because of all the restrictions. And we had more people reading from out of this country uh, to people in many multiple languages uh, read and they start. And when one person reads and stops, they pick right up at that verse and read on to the next one. It takes us four and a half days. Four and a half days. So now I participated in that and, and this is part of uh, the Faith and Liberty Ministry. It's phenomenal. When it's outside uh, prior to COVID restrictions, it's literally right on the steps of the Capitol, overlooking the reflection pond at the end of which you see uh, the Washington Monument. And mm -hmm. it is incredible to go there. And the first time that I read, I read the last chapter of the book of Revelation. But literally, you start from the very first word of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And once mm -hmm. you start, you don't finish we reading don't not even one minute until you get to the very last word of the book of Revelation. And you have 130 or so, I'm not quite sure, it's 130 or so different languages of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We so do. people can read it in Mandarin, they can read it in Portuguese, in Greek, whatever language is their native tongue, they can choose whichever Bible and read it. And that goes on. In this particular uh, year, uh, it has been in the ministry center virtually, it began mm -hmm. uh, noon on Saturday and ended the following Wednesday, and then the National Day of Prayer is on the next day on Thursday. It's an amazing ministry. If you can do this in the nation capital, in Washington, D.C., I want to challenge everybody who's watching this to do Correct. it in <laughs> their state capitals, your state capitals, mm -hmm. and to do it in your local city and county as well. The Word of God, verbatim, without stop, Rain or shine is read. Every single word from Genesis through Revelation. People that visit from around the world that just happen to come upon it are incredibly amazed that this is happening in Washington, D.C. Not something that they would expect. Also, in addition to this Capitol Hill Bible Reading Marathon, which you have hundreds and hundreds of people reading, tens and tens of thousands of people that watch around the country, you also have other ministries that Faith and Liberty is part of as well. And one of those is the ministry of reaching out to the law enforcement as well. What do you do with law enforcement in the nation's capital? So our outreaches are in many different ways, and it's so that we can touch different people. But the people that keep us safe right here on Capitol Hill is the U.S. Capitol Police Officers. And so we have given an award away. Uh, we have the uh, opportunity of having the Mansfield Room in the U.S. Capitol. It's sponsored by the Sergeant at Arms and Faith and Liberty, along with some others. Um, for the last, it's probably been 25 years that we've done mm -hmm. it, probably more than that. And we uh, work with the chief of police on the Capitol Hill police officers over at their uh, station. And we work with them to select a few men or women um, that have done something a little bit extraordinary. And not that everybody here on the Hill keeps us safe, but they pick a few. And then what we're able to do is have that in the U.S. Capitol. We present them with the award. It helps us to build those relationships and we present them with Bibles as well. One of the other things that you have been very much a part of is the nominations and the 
deliberations of the next justices of the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, the previous, most uh, recent three, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, you were very much involved in that, praying for those justices, their families, and the senators, and their staffers that are involved in this, because you're just a few steps away from the Senate building where all of this deliberation takes place for these important, important considerations for the next justices of the United States Supreme mm -hmm. Court. One of the other things, tell us about Roe versus Wade and, and what you do in the nation's capital on the steps of the Supreme Court right across from the U.S. Capitol mm -hmm. to memorialize and have people think about what's happening to our young unborn children. It's a visual that uh, really makes you think. And no one does anything on usually that anniversary. And that's one of the most important anniversaries is the Roe v. Wade. It's something that uh, you've got aborted babies. You have babies that, that are never born. And so we take 3,000 flowers. We have a prayer service and we lay those flowers from one end in front of the west side of the of the Supreme Court all the way to the other side. And the visual is so large that if you don't know why we're laying those down, you ask. If you're there, you're so moved that between the prayer service and the singing and, and uh, just yourself laying the flowers really makes you think about that anniversary and how strong and how big of an impact it has made on our nation. So critically important. And you're doing that right there at the U.S. Supreme Court steps. Right in front. And you've gotten permission to be able to do that. People can do that at their various uh, local courts or their state Supreme Courts as well. Another mm -hmm. thing that you do, and I want to also challenge people to replicate this, the live nativity scene. Tell us about that. Live nativity has been going on for well over 15 years. We start right here in front of the ministry center. And yes, we have ca camels, donkeys, sheep, calves. We have children that participate. We have adults always have a live baby. And we have probably about 45 volunteers that help us show what the true meaning of Christmas is, that gospel of Jesus Christ being born. And we have singers and we start right here at the ministry center. And right here, you can, when you, right in front where we're at here, you're looking right at, right at the Supreme Court. So we start right in front of the ministry center and then we have a slow procession over to the front of the court. This is the highest court in our nation. And we take the opportunity to, to come out in front of that court, read right from the Bible, the story of Jesus Christ being born with all of the camels and the donkeys. And it's just to show people what is visioned of that day of Christ being born. And it's an outreach. It makes people ask, what's happening? I know people can't see this, but just a little bit to uh, your right shoulder, there is a door that has a balcony. And I know that's where you have someone mm -hmm. sing. Uh, mm -hmm. on that second floor, and then down below is all of the animals, live animals that are bussed in <laughs> with the Mary and Joseph and the whole entourage and a little baby. This is not a fake baby. This is a little tiny baby. You get a, you, you have so many babies that are born in your extended <laughs> family, you always have That's a brand it. new one to bring to the live nativity. It's, it's amazing. And, but, we do, and we've had the chief of police who had his picture taken with the full nativity. We've had DHS have their picture taken, so people are interested. Well, the amazing thing is, talk about a eye stopper is when you're driving through <laughs> the nation's capital, here are all these animals, camels and donkeys and sheep and all these people. You mm -hmm. start at the front of the ministry center, looking right towards the US Supreme Court, then go across the street and then walk all the way around to the front of the Supreme Court in the background is the Supreme Court. On the other side is the Capitol. The scene is amazing. And that's where you had most recently this choir that was there singing Christmas songs, waiting for the entourage to arrive. In order for you to do that, you have to get permission from three police forces because right. just crossing the street from one side of the street invokes another police jurisdiction. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And then it you is. also have to get permission to bring <laughs> animals into the District of Columbia. You're the only ministry, Faith and Liberty is the only ministry that can bring these live animals That's into true. the nation's capital. That's I'm telling true. you, if you can do this, Peggy, everyone in the country can do this. Because yes, if you can, can go through all those hoops, it's incredible. And you, you have every year people in the Supreme Court saying, Peggy, when are you going to do the live nativity? <laughs> because they come out from their desk you can see them in the windows watching the live nativity as it processes around the Supreme Court. And that's our point. 
That is our point for not only the court, but for those on Capitol Hill, one, to take time from their desk, but to also to turn around and say to us, what are you doing? We had an actual reporter who every year just came to take pictures. That's all she was interested. And then one year she turned and said to me, I think I'm going to go back to church. Wow. So that's the impact you want on people on Capitol Hill with these type of uh, outreaches. The website is on the screen. If you want to visit Washington, D.C., you want to be involved in prayer intercessory ministry, you want to be involved in one of these many, many ministries, and we've just touched on some, you want to be able to replicate it in your state, in your city, in your county, go to the website and send us an email, Faith and Liberty which is faithandlibertydc.org, faithandlibertydc.org. Think out of the box and pray how the Lord will direct you to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to every sphere of influence in your community, in your state, and in our nation. Thank you, Peggy, for being with us today. Matt, thank you. That was an amazing interview with Peggy. There were several times when you challenged others. And I'd like to come back to, for those people watching from home, about how Peggy, what she's accomplished and how that could be really replicated at the local or even the state level, just for folks, people, average people, right, that could do that. Yeah, I mean, you can have the Bible reading marathon in your state or local area. You can honor law enforcement. You can have a live nativity scene or some other type of nativity scene that brings the real reason for the season there. You can also remember our unborn children, all the lives that have been lost uh, in January during the remembrance of Roe versus Wade and the many lives that were lost. So I encourage you to replicate what is happening in Washington, D.C. through the Ministry of Faith and Liberty throughout your state and your local area. If it can be done in Washington, D.C. with all the red tape that has to be done and considered, then it can be done anywhere. Matt, thanks again. For those of you at home, uh, our prayer is with every episode of Freedom Alive that we can bring you hope, peace, truth, and courage in a very confusing time in our country. You are not alone, and I hope we've been able to share that with you in this episode, that there are people, there are organizations that God has mobilized throughout the country to fight for biblical values. Well, that's it for today, but be sure to tune in next week where we will update you on existing battles and alert you to new government overreaches. We'll tell you about the victories people of faith are winning and how you too can fight back to keep your freedom alive. Watch Freedom Alive every week at the same time on the same channel.